Senator from Connecticut. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Um, Mr. President, um, let me just make clear what happened over the course of the last couple of days, because I've heard many of my colleagues come down to the floor today and claim that this is a bipartisan bill that's on the floor of the United States Senate today, which would strike a lot of Americans as curious because the votes are not bipartisan. So how could that be? How could it be a bipartisan process, as has been claimed by my Republican colleagues, and yet there is not bipartisan agreement? Well, let's start from the beginning. Instead of deciding to write this legislation from the beginning with Republicans and Democrats in the room, the leader decided to write the bill initially, bringing together a consensus of Republican senators, and then bringing Democrats to the table. And there was a period of time for about 24 hours in which Democrats were in the room and we were making progress, and that was a great 24 hours. And then all of a sudden, on Saturday night, Democrats were let out of the room. And on Sunday morning, lobbyists on K Street sent a draft of legislation to chiefs of staff here that Democrats had not had any part in writing. And so you can't call it a bipartisan piece of legislation if Democrats weren't involved in the beginning and then they were let out of the room at the end. We appreciate having some input in the middle, but we clearly ended up with a product that doesn't have bipartisan buy-in. And much of that is because of the process that led us here. The decision could have been made to include both parties at the table from the very beginning. Because guess what? We do have differences of opinion. We do have different ways of looking at this crisis. And our objections are policy objections. I mean, spare me the righteous indignation about Democrats trying to settle outside political scores in the context of this legislation. Let me tell you what I care about. What I care about is making sure that if we're going to spend $2 trillion, that we spend it wisely. And if you spend $2 trillion and you don't stop the virus, then you haven't done anything meaningful in the long run. right? Because this is first a public health crisis that is causing an economic crisis. And so, yes, one of the things that is an open issue in negotiations right now is whether we are putting in enough money to health care providers, nursing homes, hospitals, states, and municipalities to give them the resources to stop this virus in its tracks. We don't believe that this bill today has enough resources in it for states, municipalities, hospitals, nursing homes, and health care providers to stop the virus. We don't think that this Congress is serious enough about the crisis in the medical supply chain today, in which our states and our hospitals and our health care providers are engaged in a Lord of the Flies environment in which they are trying to bid against each other for scarce medical supplies. We think that this bill shortchanges the people who are actually going to stop this virus in its tracks. And so, yes, we don't think it's wise to rush to spend $2 trillion if the bill doesn't stop the public health epidemic. That is a policy disagreement that we have. It is a policy disagreement that we have. And had Democrats been in the room with Republicans at the beginning, middle, and end, we wouldn't be here today. So as many Republicans as want can come down to this floor and say that it's one party that's responsible for this impasse, but had Democrats not been ushered out of the negotiations on Saturday night, had Democrats been there from the beginning, we likely wouldn't be here. Now second, yes, we do have policy disagreements over how we spend the enormous amount of money that is going to end up in the hands of corporations. And for those of us that were here in 2008, for those of us that voted for that bailout bill, we have regrets and reservations about how that went down because much of that money ended up in the pockets of CEOs and shareholders. Now, I get it. We want to get the money out fast, and you are not going to be able to account for every single dollar. But what we're talking about here, which is applying very minimal conditions for job retention to 
literally hundreds of billions of dollars in my taxpayer money is not wise policy. If we don't have assurances that the billions of dollars that we're going to hand to big companies is used to preserve jobs, then I'm going to tell you my constituents don't want to spend that money unless they know that it's going to hold on to jobs. And we have policy disagreements about that right now. I, I, I take my Republican friends at their word that they believe that the restrictions in the bill are good enough. We don't think they are. We don't think they are. And so we think we should work together throughout the day to get this right, to make sure that every dollar is there necessary to stop this virus, to stop looking at it at an economic crisis first and a public health crisis second, and that we should make sure that there are real requirements on this $2 trillion to make sure that it doesn't end up in the hands of people who don't need it, that it ends up protecting jobs, not, not just, not just in, the, in the hope of protecting jobs, but the actual result is protecting jobs. And these are policy disagreements that we have, but they are disagreements that we are still fighting over today because of the process, because of the process. And so you're angry and we're angry. We're angry from being shut out at the beginning. We're angry for being shut out at the end. Because our Republican colleagues knew that you couldn't pass anything without 60 votes. You knew as you were developing this legislation that you needed to get bipartisan buy-in. And yet there was a limited opportunity for us to have input here. And now we're engaged in a series of votes that are foregone conclusion until we get on the same page. And we can, because I, I, from what I understand, and I admit I'm not one of the negotiators in the room, but from what I understand, these are not unbridgeable differences. These are not unbridgeable differences. We can figure out a way to put tighter controls on the funding that is going to companies and corporations. Just make sure that if we're going to spend $2 trillion that we spend it right, and to make sure that we aren't shortchanging our states and our hospitals. There's provisions in the first draft of this bill that would limit which kind of providers get Medicaid dollars and which won't. Our belief is that that language actually leaves a whole bunch of healthcare providers out in the cold. Now, some have said that that was intentional, that that was because Republicans didn't want Medicaid dollars to go to abortion providers. That sounds like politics to me, but that's just something I read in the paper. I don't know that that's true. What I do know is that whether or not that decision was about politics, the politics of reproductive health care, it's still just not good policy to leave a whole bunch of health care providers outside when it comes to the additional Medicaid money that is absolutely necessary to make sure that we have what it takes to stand up defenses against this virus. That's a policy difference. And I can sit here making accusations that Republicans are bringing outside political issues into this process, like Senator Barrasso made accusations about Democrats. But aside from that question, it's just still not good policy to limit the number of health care providers that can get this additional Medicaid money. When everybody is in this together, when we know that every single health care institution by the end of this week is going to be dealing with patients who have positive tests for COVID-19. These are policy differences. But policy differences that didn't have to be outstanding today had the process run by the majority party been different, been more inclusive. I agree that back home, my constituents do not care about who takes credit for this, who drafts it. They want a bill done. They want assurances that money is on the way. And I think we have agreement on big pieces of this. I may not love the small business provision of this bill. I put a different concept on the table that I think is better than the one that Democratic and Republican colleagues have come up with. But you know what? I will not let on that front the perfect be the enemy of the good. I think we've made tremendous progress on unemployment uh, compensation insurance. Um, there are big titles of this bill that I think are in good places. We should be working out the details of those outstanding issues right now, rather than spending all of our time on the floor casting broadsides against each other. I understand my Republican colleagues are complimenting themselves on how many of them are down here on the floor blaming Democrats. You're right, there are not as many Democrats here um, levying the same charges against Republicans. but. Um, it would be better if we were all spending time trying to work out these final differences because we can get there. We can get there. I think we can get there by the end of the day 
if Republicans are committed to making sure that we attack the virus first, that we don't shortchange the public health response, and that we make sure that our taxpayers don't end up subsidizing the profits and pocketbooks of people who don't need any more help from this government. Thank you, Mr. President.